All right. Okay, we're recording. So, how are you? I'm doing well, brother. How are you? It's been a while, man. Oh, man. Yeah, it's been so like 10 years. Almost. Has it been 10 years? Since I've seen you. Like, we've kind of messaged it a little bit here and there, but uh, I've seen your bro and family um, a bit here and there. But yeah, it's a long overdue. It's long overdue. I, yes, it seems so. So I guess just for some context, so as you know, I'm on like, I don't know, hundred, like I think 120 or 110 or some episodes of uh, doing this thing called building on Bitcoin, wow. really yeah. trying to build a bit of a theme around it. You know, I, I, my, my interest is really to capture different perspectives along the spectrum, people who are new to the industry, people who have been in it forever. And um and just so people know, I guess, like, our relationship is uh, different than, I guess, most of ours. Like, most of the people I interview are people kind of in the Bitcoin space. You're not in the Bitcoin space, which I think is equally, it, it's okay. You know, I, I understand. Um, but but you, you've you recently aspiring, been... Aspiring, though. Aspiring. You've re- recently been super taken aback by the industry or some elements yeah. of it. Let's put it that way. And yeah. so I wanted to dive in and, and really uh, learn more your perspective of, you know, what you're seeing as being interesting. We'll have a little bit of fun with it as well. You know, maybe debate, go back and forth. But just so, uh, you know, listeners know also is that you and I have a bit of a history. You know, you've been friends with my brother for, like you just said, I don't know what, 15 years ago you met Sean? Uh, well, you know, I grew up in Edmonton with you, right? And yeah. you, uh, you went to school with my bros. So I think it goes back like 20 years. And then Sean wow. in Edmonton, you know, we weren't necessarily tightest, but when we, when I moved to Toronto for a couple of years, um, we became closer because we were living right close to each other. And then me and you kind of formed a bit of a, a friendship as well. So yeah, that's kind of the backstory, but it kind yeah. of comes back yeah, to it, You're right. You're right though. Your brother was in my, what? I think we were in high school together, university. I definitely remember your brother in university, but you know, you guys did yeah. not go to Harry Ainley, right? You guys were at uh, Old Skona or something, no? So uh, both my older brothers, Amir and Ali, they did go to Old Skona, but I right. did, I went to Harry Ainley. Yeah. Okay, wait, that's... Yes, I uh, wasn't in the smart school at the time. Hey, interesting. We also, I, I, I got Kay joining us. Remember I messaged you? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> okay, cool. So Kay's, uh, I, I wasn't sure if she was going to remember, but hey, Kay, how are you? We'll let her, we'll let her come on here in a second, but hey, Kay, Kay uh, there you are. Woohoo! Hi. Oh, I'm this so call sorry. just got a lot more interesting. I, I was... decided to zoom on you. Hello. <laughs> okay, this is my old friend, Ahmad. We've, uh, I, I was friends. We were just go, kind of retracing our steps, but I've known his brother, I guess, for what, tw- more than 20 years now, right? Because yeah. I've been in, yeah. in Toronto for almost 20. So since yeah. like high, I mean, since university days, but I don't know. I want to even say maybe high school. So really long. And, and Ahmad, Kay and I, we've known each other for not that, not nearly that That's long. Maybe long. what? I think it was like 2010, 2011. Yeah. 2010 is when, when I met your brother? No, is when I was like in Toronto and I we were kind right. of hanging at that time. Yeah. yeah. I was in school in the U of T. So, yeah. 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 And so, uh, so I might as good friends with my brother. Uh, he's a pharmacist. He's not in the crypto space, but is very taken aback by NFTs and all of that. And so, uh, so we were going to, you know, I've been taking a big, bit of a break from my show, but I thought it'd be fun to do a little Bitcoin versus NFT. And then I was talking to you recently and you are, you know, I guess from the industry, not, I guess you are from the industry. You've done some iconic things and you're also equally uh, bit by the NFT bug. So, you know, I thought it'd be a good, uh, a good show. It's okay. We, we, let's start with some introductions. I, I think that that might be the, a good place to go. So I'm you, you want to start? I mean, just, yeah, but in terms of, I guess, your background and, and a little bit about what we're going to be talking about today and how you got in. Yeah, so uh, I'm a pharmacist uh, by trade, um, and then I own two pharmacies, one in Victoria and one in Vancouver, and we work in um, the area of like harm reduction, mental health and addiction, um, and trying to battle that, um, but basically I'm a huge sports fan, and I am love fantasy sports forever, and I'm in some keeper leagues with some friends, actually I have a draft of three that I got to prepare for after this, uh, but Basically, the concept of that is that you basically keep a given player, say it's Connor McDavid or Leon Dreisaitl, both of which are much better than Austin Matthews in Toronto, where you are. But that's neither here nor there. But basically, uh, if you pick them when you're young, you kind of keep them in this league with your friends. So it's kind of the idea of sort of digital ownership, I think, kind of resonated with me through that. And then 
Back in um, last December 2020 Christmas um, time, I was um, kind of discovered sports card investing and how this has blown up during the pandemic. And I'm like, oh, if I could use my, you know, fantasy knowledge to apply it to, you know, get the right, the rookies, and then their value is going to go up that like, that'd be fun as well. You can make, make some money. And then through that, I discovered NBA Top Shot, mm. um, you know, which is the best thing to happen to sports since television. And, um, and basically, it just kind of changes the game because it takes a lot of the friction out of the sports card collecting aspect of it because, A, you got to maintain a physical good. And then you also have to get it graded, which you have to ship off. It might take a year to get it back. You have to have insurance, et cetera. Then if you want to list it, um, you know, you have to pay shipping fees or if you want to buy it, you got to pay shipping fees. But then I saw with NBA Top Shot, um, you know, in an instant, I can buy and sell it um, with no transaction fees and basically with anybody in the world. And also it changes the game instead of just a picture on a piece of cardboard of some random media day, it's instead the actual moments and highlights that, you know, is kind of characterized the game. Like if you go to a Raptors game tonight, like when you walk into that arena, what are you remembering? You're remembering those great plays, those great moments. So they've basically figured out a way to take like their magic sauce and bottle it up and selling it, sell it to their most diehard fans. Um, and so that really resonated with me. And I started connecting with friends about this. I'm like, hey, this is cool that I knew like basketball. And I've like, you know, created new friends as a result. Um, and that's the thing that excites me about it is that, you know, I, I know we're going to talk about Bitcoin as well, but Bitcoin, I feel like you have the Bitcoin community, but the NFT is the pro power of it to me is that you can form a community around literally anything. Just basically, whether it be art, whether it be sports, um, etc. So that's kind of what got me into it. And then this summer, I've been dabbling into some uh, other like Ethereum based NFTs and things of that nature. And um, yeah, I just really, I, the, one of the things I love most about it is the power to give the power back to the artist or back to the creator where, you know, through the smart contract, they can basically have a percentage every time that it sells. So if they, they can basically control and uh, enjoy all of their success directly with their um, fans without a middleman involved. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of in a nutshell, what kind of excites me about it. And, and also just the feeling of it being early, you know, like I, I, I think Bitcoin, like I should have listened to you in 2011. So I'm, you know, uh, you know, going to eat with eat that. Um, but, but yeah, I feel NFTs, I'm kind of really early on it. And that's another exciting aspect of it for me. Cool. I, I like that as a, a good kind of level set start off point. Kay, you're, you, uh, you want to do an introduction as well? And then sure. I don't know, I was, I was a bit, sur not surprised, but I was pleasantly surprised. Let's put it that way that with I our conversation. <laughs> well, actually that and from our conversation earlier this week. So I was like, oh, you got to join our call. I'm like, we're going to have a little battle. Oh, not a battle, your friendly battle. It might get dirty though. I mean, we're not. For sure, for sure. <laughs> well, hello, 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 everybody. Um, so I actually came from asset management traditional back in the day. Uh, did several years for a hedge fund and also a private client. I have my brokerage license, broker license, but I never had my own book. Um, and like later on in my asset management career, I kind of got into like alternative investments, like pure play. And I really lost confidence in fiat holding value. And so by 2017, I started looking out and I started looking at uh, this company based in Singapore that is doing kind of like a fixed income style, but has cryptocurrency in it and so I was like well I need to put that into the map in Canada and put it into a registered account and so I joined 3IQ when it was like no one it was Fred Pai and myself essentially and brought in the first multi-crypto asset fund in an accredited investor style and the concept was to prove the use case that it can be held in cold, cold storage air gap and it would be safe, right? And so I wasn't as early in the Bitcoin world as Sunny and you guys. Um, I literally heard about it like and properly looked at it around 2017 only. I heard it about it when it, it was 600 bucks, but I never took it seriously. And the way I jumped in was more like, how much was I willing to lose in poker? And that was my play and I put it into Coinbase. And so with that, um, idea of putting it into like a fund. Um, the next step was the long game was put it into a, you know, publicly listed fund. And so did that. And that was my foray in crypto. So 
you know, going forward, I just couldn't go back into traditional asset management. Um, I, I just lost the flavor for me. And like, um, you know, I started looking into, okay, what else is out there that is kind of like an asset class that I can, you know, you know, with given the technology, you know, how can you actually use it in, in such a way that it's not an ICO craze, right? And this is kind of like when I started looking into NFTs. Initially, I started to see how, you know, because you could do NFTs with Bitcoin, it's just very expensive, right? So the use case of NFT um, on Ethereum is still fairly expensive, but not as expensive as Bitcoin. So I still hold Bitcoin, but I'm a holder for that. I use it as, you know, my store of value. But for like day to day and like, you know, trying to figure out, I love how you thought about it in a way where it's, you know, sports, because I grew up with my brother playing Magic the Gathering cards or like collecting like um, uh, Spider-Man, like comic books, right? And I was like, this is perfect. You know what I mean? How do you keep the royalties on the creator side and, and monetize it that way so that everybody wins? And you kind of like, you know, I'm not always saying remove all the middleman because sometimes they help with liquidity and creating a base price. But at the end of the day, you do want to pay back to like the people who are actually, you know, working on it. So for example, one of the key things that we thought about for, for art is like, you know, the sculptures, like it's hard for the artists to kind of like trace back to say, oh, like um, I have this audience and what my engagement model is with respect to like a physical thing, especially if they're like, you know, thousands of miles away, right? But what if you put a QR code in there and then NFT buy it such that, you know, it's geolocating and then, you know, X amount of people are hovering around that kind of like sculpture. Um, when I spoke with one artist, Canadian artist, who was basically um, doing all this sculpture, I said to him, are you still doing sculpting and like whatever, are you doing commissions? And he goes, not really. He goes, I'm kind of like turned off a little bit because like I can't get my engagement back, you know, level and I have no visibility on it. And I said, this is like a prime example to do NFTs, you know what I mean, on a physical thing. And this is kind of like my foray into, into this world. And I absolutely love it. I look at it more as like, you know, using Ethereum, but you know, um, NBA Top Shot uses Flow, for example, which is really a good um, blockchain as well. But I think with cross pollination and you know interoperability with different chains it might make sense to stick to kind of like the EVM and also the side chains that work with it but I, I attack this more as a, a engagement model um, a new way to kind of like brand um, to get brand following and kind of like revive archived kind of like advertisements in a way interesting interesting well, that's fascinating. So maybe maybe I'll start with I'll bring up uh, just something that I was talking to Ahmad about last week, which I have a hard time getting my head around. So if you talk about a simple NFT, let's say a JPEG of so a picture of whatever an icon of a guy's face, right? Just to make it super simple, what I was having a hard time really getting my head around is is like that JPEG that I'm seeing right now on my screen is screenshotable. I can share with anyone. I technically have the same ones and zeros that you have, which is the the original NFT. But there's some sort of tie between your JF, JPEG and, and, you know, let's say whatever blockchain. I mean, and you could even argue that all these other blockchains outside of Bitcoin are kind of not really immutable. And is it really that scarce? But but I'm just curious. So how is it different in your mind, though? Is it is it I mean, the only thing I've heard is that, oh, it's like equivalent to a signature. But is, is that how you think about it? Ahmed, do you want to take Ahmed, do you, I, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like that, that top shot, let's say, or you were talking about. Like that, that image is literally available. You talked about, oh, everybody can coalesce around it. Yeah, I've got it on YouTube. Yeah, actually, it's a good thing if it's uh, being spread on YouTube because then it makes like my collectible more valuable. So I prefer that it be spread. Um, but it's similar to, I think the analogy that's used is like the Mona Lisa. Like I could have a picture of it on my phone or I could print it up, print it out and put it on my wall. Mm. And sure, it's the same picture when I look at it or the same you know, general image that I'm looking at, but doesn't mean that you have the actual original. I think part of um, like this collectible phase of NFTs is that you have to sort of accept some of the art type thinking or the collectible market type thinking that if you have the actual original that the actual creator touched and the creator created, then there's more value in that than just some copy. Um, like 
I guess my question to you as well is like, I, and I'm not an engineer, so I don't understand all the technical things. So forgive me, the question is kind of dumb, but what if somebody took the same code and created like Bitcoin two um, and created a whole other network? Is that something that's possible or is it impossible because, you know, uh, Satoshi's gone or whatever, but, um, but yeah, like, I guess what difference does it make in that case that somebody could make a copy of a given cryptocurrency? Does that mean the original is uh, devalued? That's a good question. I mean, so there are forks, that's what they call them, of Bitcoin, of Ethereum. Mm -hmm. In fact, Ethereum, or what you know as Ethereum today, is a fork, actually. it's mm -hmm. uh, There's something called Ethereum Classic, which is the original Ethereum. Um, but because Vitalik and you know his team didn't agree with what the original Ethereum people agreed with, uh, they decided to fork it. And that, again, kind of goes back to this central point around, you know, we can talk about Flow or Dapper or this, you know, the next Solana or the next fastest blockchain. But, you know, Ethereum kind of, I think, you know, CryptoKitties, they, they popularize this idea of NFTs is that, you know, you know, is it like you said, is it is it like it's forkable? So even the underlying, you know, digital signature is technically changeable. Um, but I think that's besides the point. I'm trying to first grasp like your guys's point along the lines of like, you know, what is it? That That's really fascinating. You say that. So so how does this like I'll be honest, I don't know a lot about Top Shots. Um, I, I, I have friends that are into it. But like, well, how does that work? So you're saying that you can go and buy you you watch a, an episode or not an episode it shows how much sports I watch. Well, this, watch this picture right here. You see this picture? Yeah. This is Kawhi's shot, right? So yes. if there was only 100 of those that are officially licensed hmm. from the NBA, right? They're the ones who own who are who own those rights, officially licensed a hundred of them on the blockchain, um, on Flow and Top Shot. That's going to have value because first of all, Top Shot people say it's a YouTube highlight, but there is a bit more to it. Like it's kind of a mm. cube shape and it kind of twists and opens. And uh, the pack, the pack opening aspect is like really fun aspect too. Um, then it has like a thumbnail picture. It has the stat line, so it's kind of like a historical record. So as a fan. You could kind of go back and look and see, oh, what what was Giannis's stat line? Obviously, you can find this anywhere, but in terms of just being a collectible, um, so the actual Top Shot, to be honest, like sure somebody could maybe copy it and put it on YouTube, but nobody's going to pay you for that. But people, I mean, all of this stuff, we have to kind of agree as people that there's value there, and people in Top Shot have attached value to it. But there's also utility that's going to come with Top Shot. Like for example, um, I went to summer league um, and in Vegas this year, and um, and basically they had Top Shot kiosk there, and so you can go buy Top Shot moments from the game that you were actually watching that day. So that how I said they bottled up like kind of their um, secret sauce. But even also there, I met a bunch of other people who were in Top Shot, and they're like, "Oh, you remember that pack drop during All Star Weekend? You know that was." crazy and, and, uh, and, I'm, and I'm at what's stopping top nature. shots what's stopping nba from like you just said issuing a digital license and creating a bunch of these uh you know these nfts well, well that they are can, but they can actually there's nothing stopping them the only way for for the, the entire like nba or a top shot to even do that is that they actually have a one-on-one -on -one license with the NBA league, you know what I mean? So for example, you can't just create an NFT for your favorite baseball player, for example, you need to have an agreement with MLB to just be like, listen, we want to start NFTs. Um, that's kind of the key thing, but like with respect to like, um, uh, you know, your question of like, how, you're right. I don't see any value with glorified gifties, for example, like, you know, pictures or whatever, or memes that is just like, that's what an NFT is. But the key thing is that once you put it on blockchain, then you have that cryptographic hash. There are wallets that are currently being made where in such a way that, you know, even Meta, MetaMask, like for example, you can do MetaMask NFTs I think it has an access token. So for example, you want to go to like a private dinner, maybe like CryptoPunk, for example, and then they'll be like, you can only attend this private dinner that's happening in New York if you have a cigar and a red hair type of CryptoPunk. Like that's kind of like where this is evolving. And a lot of companies now are kind of saying, if you own this specific NFT based on whatever attributes there is, then you ha have access for first dibs of this limited collection of physical item, for example, or limited access to this type of event. And I really see that this is kind of like where it could go. Like, let's talk about Drake, for example. What if Drake wants to do a private, private concert at a dinner, right? 
like it's greatest application of things like that. Wait, hold on, Eventbrite. Like I, I did events all the time. What do you mean? Like uh, no, 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 I, no, no, no not events. Eventbrite. Like yeah, yeah so well, Eventbrite. Events, why, why would I? Eventbrite yeah, Eventbrite starts to do NFTs, right? But I meant to say that you come mm. to the door and you're you can't you're not gonna get in just because you show that you have a picture. Show me that that picture is on the blockchain. Then I'll let you in. Prove to me Which that blockchain? you own it. Well, whatever blockchain that NFT is in. Got it. So okay. I get, let's say like the Soho house, right? It's a membership. So if your membership is living on the NFT, then basically you own that. As long as you have that NFT, then you can go to the Soho house. But if a Soho house becomes super popular, everybody wants to go there. And you say, hey, you know what? I've gotten my fill of going there. The value of the NFT, the value of the membership has gone up. So I'm going to sell it off to somebody else. And then somebody else will have that membership so that's another use case for um, but what's zoho house sorry is that like, zoho so host like the the fancy place where people have yeah like a fancy oh, yeah. hotel yeah. 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 but they have that yeah. today and they don't need a blockchain to exist is my point i've been to those places you know you go with some rich people every now oh, i know and i'm, I'm saying that's but, another way of doing it another it's way another, way. Right. another way of same solving same the problem that's already been with, solved um, um, oh, club like right? Okay, club okay, like okay. memberships go for like two hundred fifty thousand dollars, right? You know what's oh, never club. been possible before? <laughs> Censorship <laughs> resistant, open source, decentralized money. Uh, but I agree. Okay, so I, I want to agree to disagree on one thing. So I, I'm not against NFTs or ICOs or anything for that matter, because uh, I, I like the free market. So I think everybody fundamentally should get to buy whatever they want. And so I, I endorse, you know, I, I mean, I, I encourage you to, to put your money on NFTs. I guess the, the, the conversation I was kind of more hoping to have is around at a time like this, you know, when just look at like the arc of like the history of human humanity here. Okay. Never before has a decentralized open source censorship resistant form of money ever been available with a track record in the last 10 years outpacing anything in the history of mankind at a time when tyranny is raining upon us from every direction isn't bitcoin the most important thing and isn't it like comparing like the sun to the moon or something like shouldn't our attention be on this thing that is literally, I believe in some ways, our last hope of freedom on planet Earth. Okay, maybe I'm being a little bit overdramatic. Um, but I'm just saying compared to cute kitties and guys throwing basketballs, I mean, balls through little hoops, like that that's what we're going to get excited about. Not to disrespect. I do like basketball. I shoot hoops all the time. I could school you in a game of ball, Ahmad. You know that. You know that. I know that. What I'm trying to do is put things into perspective. Does it matter? Your, your turn. I think for me, it's like, I feel like I'm just late with Bitcoin, you know, like with the NFTs, like the way that I'm at, like, and I'm not necessarily not a game. too late. You're not yet too late. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, yeah, I'm not too late, but I think like, I'm thinking to myself, like maybe I can get some of these like um, higher X in a shorter period of time returns with some of these NFTs. And then I will heed to your advice and start putting it into Bitcoin, although it's like up again today. So the more I say that, the worse it becomes. But even if I look at, um, like where it was, uh, say, like when I started with this, um, you know, the multiples of X return in that short a period of time aren't necessarily there as compared to like some of the Ethereum NFTs um, that are out there. So that's kind of part of it. But I think... Um, no, I think that I think that's a very honest answer. I, just, I think that, I mean, that to me resonates because and now we're peeling the onion back and we're getting to a more, I would say, a root cause of this conversation, which isn't that NFTs are necessarily solving anything like revolutionary. It's that we feel like we missed out, right? My two cents on that, having been alive 10 years ago, having been alive today, I believe that the risk adjusted outlook of Bitcoin today is greater than it was 10 years ago. I know that sounds insane to say it's gone up a billion and a half percent. But I, I personally believe that 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 the fifty thousand dollars or whatever it's at today, fifty seven, sixty thousand dollars, we're gonna look back five years from now and even be like, oh my god, like fifty thousand. You know what I would give to buy, you know, a fraction of a bitcoin at fifty grand. So whereas, whereas I agree, there are gonna be limited opportunities with NFTs that allow you to make massive gains, but it's like gambling, right? Like you could make massive gains by going to Vegas, right? The question is, is 
can you get behind it? Can you not only put your own money, but is it scalable? Is it something that others can also do systematically and free themselves from tyranny? Maybe that's not even our goal. But my point is, is like, look, at the end of the day, if you hold 90% of your wealth in Bitcoin and you're playing with 5% or 1% of your funds in NFTs, like Kay suggested, I can't argue with that. Like if it's something that you're having fun with, maybe you're building a business even. I think Kay's Maybe you can't talk about it on this call that much, but she's working on some, you yeah, know, about it. Yeah. problems. Some problems. <laughs> I think that may be right. And even the top shot thing, I don't think it's actually that uncool. I think it's kind of cool. I always break it down to like, you know, how, how does it really change anything? Maybe, yeah, I guess it's fun. <laughs> well, you know what, Sunny? For me, I am in that mm. category where I'm actually ninety five percent in Bitcoin, and my play money is NFTs. Yeah. Um, but I actually see NFTs, I literally approach it as a use case. So for example, let's say pre-Bitcoin, there was fiat and there were player cards, basketball playing cards that hold value to this day, right? And that's essentially a new form of doing a digital collectible. Mm. That's exactly how I see it. And um, I there's a lot of upside opportunity on the NFTs, but I'm not chasing Bitcoin or NFT on price. And anytime Bitcoin dips at 50, I'm buying in. You know what I mean? And I'm like iron stomach about it. And but because my I have a long game on that. With NFTs, I would say 90% doesn't have any value at all. Like you know what I mean? And and that's kind of like dangerous. If you look at it as a um as an investment piece, mm -hmm. you need to work with an NFT curator or broker to figure out will this have value because you there's scoring system to it there's um understanding what chains on you know what i mean for it to to have value and then uh, on top of that it's the use case component of it right um and i'm always very careful actually i people always say why don't you just tokenize like you know your nft and and do it kind of like you know hybrid with non-fungible and fungible and i'm like you know what i'm actually scared because then i'm crossing over to like you know, becoming an investment fund manager again. And I do mm. not have that license at the moment. So, you know, you know, then I don't want the SEC to basically come in and like, you know, say that I am securitizing or fractionalizing, right. um, you know, brands. But there are people that actually do that. Like um, there are people now who take a Picasso and they fractionalize it as an NFT so that everybody gets a piece of ownership. Now, there's no, it's no different from somebody doing that in a fund level, like traditional asset management, which I'm, is, I'm also seeing, but I'm actually thinking that if you convert and become, use like a, a blockchain component, it opens up to like the hundred million crypto users. And, and now it becomes more approachable. It's not just like blue chip art and investors that come into this place. It's like, you're gonna get people that have bought people, for example, mm -hmm. right? And it's it's just, you know, if, if there's no value in the NFTs, I wouldn't see traditional kind of like auction houses capitalizing on it. And oh, there's sharp, a lot of hype, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah, Sotheby's, Christie's, right? Um, and they know yeah. what they're doing. So hmm. that's just... I think, yeah, yeah if I may add, I think, the, I think the thing that you're underestimating about NFTs is the power. Basically, to me, NFTs are so powerful because it's about culture. And I think if we look, you're looking at human civilization. Hit us. Hit us hard, and, bro. Uh, <laughs> this is his line. He's been building up for this one. <laughs> yeah. That, so basically, like, you know, you look at human human civilization um, yeah. and how important is culture. And you, you know, you got your Bitcoin and you got money and you're so excited about it. But why is that? Because so you can go and enjoy in the cultural type things that you want, whether it be traveling, um, food you want to eat, whether mm -hmm. it's going to music shows or art or sports or, or whatnot or put nice art on your wall so it all kind of your end goal too with having as much money as you want of course there's a comforts and a lot of other things for sure but culture is a big part of that and i think with nfts is it's able to basically connect people around a given culture and that's why it has so much power and can kind of change things and i think also like just looking at the internet today with social media and whatnot, we're, we're the, what's being sold, you know, mm -hmm. but um, in this case, we can actually take ownership and of what we're presenting to the world on the internet. Um, and just another point on NFTs that like, if, if you look at like human society, when human beings started deciding, okay, we need to start owning land and having a contract, like this is my land. Like how did that change society? A lot, right? So this is basically the way to create assets 
on the internet. So I think it's huge. And I think like Bitcoin, I guess like, I know you wanted like a debate, but I'm like more, uh, I have FOMO about Bitcoin. I'm, I want to get in on Bitcoin and I'm kind of, you know, need to wake up and get in on there, get in on that. But the thing with Top Shot, that exactly, I'm a perfect use case is you should love Top Shot. You should love NFTs. And I think it's probably helping Bitcoin and the Bitcoin price right now because it's bringing all these new people into the crypto space in a way that's digestible. It's a way that connects with them. Like I was already at nighttime when I'm relaxing, I'm watching sports. I was on my fantasy hockey, fantasy basketball, fantasy football, but now I'm on my top shot, you know, I'm on my NFT. So it's just kind of like how I'm relaxing, how I'm in, how I'm connecting with my culture um, of sports or, or whatever it might be. It could be around a given you know, um, say it's Iranian culture, my culture, or Indian culture or whatnot, like it's a way to kind of connect people um, on the internet and you can find people from around the world and build communities kind of around that. Um, so that's why I think it's so powerful and it's kind of not an out uh, Bitcoin or NFTs, yeah. but it's actually an and. And uh, I think the, yeah, like you should be happy that the NFTs- like, Oh, no, no, I, I am. Ultimately, I am. Ultimately, I am. I just, I just think like Bitcoin versus NFT is a much juicier, clickable, you know, uh, <laughs> clickbait topic than uh, Bitcoin and NFTs. <laughs> well, well, if we compare like fiat versus having like high end art, maybe over the years, probably having high end art, um, having the culture, cultural tie, the cultural artifacts, arguably might have more value than the currency. Yeah, yeah, or even the the digital piece of like Banksy's Banksy, like you know the artist that that yeah, yeah, uh, I know yeah, he, he basically created an NFT and made a joke out of it, and then it, essentially what he did was that he actually destroyed his physical form of of creation, and and then because of value, ah, he said that's mind sticks, mind blasting on like the that. digital <laughs> aspect of it being on the blockchain, you know. But okay. um, cool. for me, like you know, go back to use cases. Like Ooh, that, sorry, that, I, I don't know. That. I like nice purses. I like watches. You know what I mean. And, and there's a lot of deep fakes on that. So I see going forward, you know, as a warranty or you know those serial numbers that you can technically copy. You can't copy that on a blockchain. So that's the way I see this. Thing. I, I, I was listening to the people. Like the guy, the Indian guy that lives in Singapore, yeah. the kid rather that bought. The uh, I think it's Medicaban. Yeah, something, something like that, right? And uh, and I was trying as I was watching this thing. I'm trying to like I'm asking the same questions I'm asking you guys, right? Like with JPEG. Like what's the difference? But the part that I found the coolest about the interview was when he was talking about his his jacket. He was like, "This jacket is an NFT," and like the designer, you know, put the QR. But that's what it is. Like, it's about flexing. Like, it's about the flex right yeah online flex <laughs> mm, mm, that was like my first bit of kind of an aha moment because i could because I mean, people obviously like clothes and designer wear and this and that and if it's a way a for, for me you. to go to a website and confirm that the producer in fact did create so, it and Sunny, would you, i could see want... i could see some value in that i mean i'm not gonna you know part with my you know crypto bitcoin yet but sure i mean i'm starting to see the light a bit this is why i wanted to have this this conversation you know so Sunny, would you like uh, right now? Would you like to have a blue check mark on Twitter? Would I like to have? Of course. I mean, why wouldn't I? Oh, so why? Why would you? It's just digital. It's just on uh, a, a website, and you don't technically own that. They could take that away from you. But what if you could own that? What if you controlled, uh, you know, your flex on your on your profile? I think I so missed you, the connection there. Okay, what if I control the flex on my profile? So you wanted a blue check mark. Why do you want a blue check mark? Well, I think I mean there's a this is kind of a loaded question, but I I think like if it if it is what you know most people think it is, it signifies you know a bit more authority. And Twitter has decided that you're not some fake scammer. So Unocoin, our, our account has a blue check mark, and and it's not rocket science. You have to just submit, uh, you have to submit something and give them a couple of pieces of evidence, like in, in the news that you are in fact the holder of that. Um, so so I yeah I guess it it, it gives you a bit more but authority. But I don't think I'm yeah. Yeah, it signifies something. So I think like, mm -hmm. you know, I wish I had one, but like a crypto punk, when you make your crypto, uh, crypto punk, your profile picture and Twitter is going to be making it such that you can actually verify did they do they own it. So you can't necessarily just copy and paste. So then it shows, OK, you're like either an OG to crypto because you got a crypto punk, you know, for free in 2017 
or you're a baller and you have a lot of money and you pay 400 grand for one of them. So it's signifying something um, about that. Oh, I'm also on the cutting edge of, so Visa bought a crypto punk, 150 grand. So why do they do that? Because they're trying to signify, Hey, we're seeing this crypto world and uh, we're paying attention. Plus, if you look at it from a marketing perspective, they could have marketed that commercials and the money would have gone like to the heavens. But right now they spend all that money. They got all this publicity off of the CryptoPunk. Plus the CryptoPunk's value is higher now. So all these marketing budgets, if it's just going towards like NFTs, because it's signifying some sort of cultural currency, then um, it, it sort of changes the game on marketing as well. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of put, picking up what you're putting down. Okay, you, you, you made a reference to ICOs and you said, oh, uh, it's different this time, right? Um, I, I was around during ICOs. I used to have events with a thousand people in downtown Toronto, five-star hotel. Remember, everybody was giving, feeding me all these lines and, you know, and I, I had a similar response. And I definitely, was, I don't think I was wrong. I mean, uh, maybe there's one or two here that, that, that came out of that, that space uh, as a mild success. But by and large, people lost money so what, what am i what what's different this time what, what's so different about it? And nfts feels like it's icos for art or something like that mm, yes and no yes and no because the icos didn't really have a proper use case like i the, the you know everyone was just trying to come up with another blockchain for example that is supposed to punk out like bitcoin not gonna happen we understood the technology behind it and so like i think that nfts nfts if it's tied into a specific use case, the same way a strategy as Visa is doing it, or if you have a, a board ape and you show up in a in a lounge in like the airport to to get in, like I I feel like this is a new type of like point system essentially. Um, and there's a, if that if there's a use case component that is tied to the NFT specifically, other than it being a picture, then 100%. I do not think that this is an ICO craze. You know, like I see it's kind of funny because they did it as almost like a reverse, like, you know, need liquidity. Um, how are you going to raise money really, really quickly? NFT is like grassroots. Like it's, it, there's value because there's community engagement and you can't de facto say that that does not have value. It's like same thing as that, you know, that Twitter, for example, because it's decentralized, then, you know, you've got bad players on on Twitter that whose accounts get barred all the time and like you know imagine if that was in an NFT and in a decentralized fashion you cannot like just keep it hostage or something because you put effort in it right and so this is the way I see NFTs are like you know if there's say for example stolen art right you've got a whole bunch of stolen art and then there's people that work in the background trying to authenticate that and I feel like if you do a certificate in an NFT to say, I've authenticated this. So every time you sell it now, this NFT needs to go with that. It's not a binder anymore to say, this is like the 10 volumes of binder that I did as a research to make sure that this is a legit product, you know what I mean? Or legit painting. So that's kind of like where this is. And there is no different than, than like, and the thing is that if you really come to think about it, um, the world's coming really, really fast. Like, you know, things are changing. So you're shifting so dramatically. Things need to be like, like on a digital, you know, I, like some form of digital thing. And the NFT is immutable. So health records can go on it. You've got people that are like freaking dying in North America, for example, and they have to go to Europe in order for them to take all their, their health data, for example, how are, you know, they have to call all their, all their doctors, you know, all the specialists and get them to put it in a unified compact way so that they can send it to another specialist up in Europe or something like that right and so the way i see this is that as things evolve you're gonna see uh blood transfusions you know tagged with an nft to say where it came from what type of blood is it you know what i mean and where is it where is it going to be most helpful in a way and and that's just it right you know we talk about voting as well um there's a plethora of ideas right um like nfts on bitcoin would be perfect but at the same time, it's costly and it's a store of value. So no one would want to, to transact on it, right? You hold it because of that. And I think the next available option on, on the blockchain would be the, uh, you know, not the same solution, but like on a blockchain trying to actually solve some, some, some uh, like pain or, or something like that. I, 
NFTs are kind of like dangerous, right? You, you, or like crypto in general, you don't want to uh, be the vitamin for, for like um, technology. Like, you know, Sunny, you and I talked about this the other day. You're like, you know, it's, it's feel for you, it feels like NFTs is just trying to like create a problem rather than solve it. You know what I mean? I, I see NFT as a potential to just, uh, to be an actual like painkiller if that makes any sense. <laughs> I think like if I, yeah, like in, in terms of, like I wasn't really into the ICO type thing, so I'm not mm. totally sure about that. But I guess for me, it's in general, I'm trying to go and buy NFTs that are tied to an intellectual property that resonates me with me from a cultural perspective. So, mm. you know, I, I like sports and I watch like Marvel movies um, with my partner, Francis and, um, so I'm on this VV app and they're selling, um, Marvel is releasing, you know, officially licensed comic books, um, of their earliest comics, like Spider-Man, um, I have a good number of them <clears throat> and, uh, and, you know, Hulk and Avengers and things of that nature. And it's actually the really cool thing about that app with VV is that they have an augmented reality function where you can actually place like, and they have digital statues or kind of toys that um that's a collector um, thing as well that you can actually place in your room and have like a kind of ho- a digital object or holograph through your phone right now but hopefully in the future you know it'd be on your glasses and whatnot and i think one of the points i wanted to make about it is that like just kind of looking at the future you know what is the future it's you know the children you know the kids and when i show my uh my niece is like my VV app and oh look, look you can see Superman or Supergirl in here and go find her they they love it they see it in a real world it's kind of like Pokemon Go when you're kind of put a layer of reality onto our real our worlds um, it kind of gets exciting and and look at like video games and kids these days like how much money is being spent on Fortnite for skins for like these digital you know flex um, or whether any video games to buy you know um, different tools in the video game but as soon as that uh, video game they come up with a new one you're going to want to upgrade and you're going to lose everything so already people are spending millions of dollars on digital goods that they have no control over no ownership true ownership over um so that's where like games like axie infinity that i'm not involved in but um it's a game where you actually instead of like play for free, it's play to earn. So if you play, then you can earn rewards that are worth money. And there's people actually, and I heard of like in the Philippines that are like, or that's their income is playing Axie Infinity. Um, and if you look at video games, like even video games, like arguably is like getting bigger than professional sports. Like um, I don't really watch it much, but um, even on the sports channels in Canada here, they have like video game tournaments and would you have thought you know that somebody could make a millions of dollars make a living playing video games no but it's happening I, I don't necessarily do it but I see kind of that happening um so yeah it's, it's kind of a digital world is being created um out there and I think the kids of the future it's just kind of inherent to their like life already you know I think for me and for us like Sunny like growing up in Edmonton and stuff like we were you know, you like, you know, meditation and things in the real world. And I do too. I love nature. Everybody does too. But I think good or bad, our world is going more in the digital realm and the digital world. And this is a way to have property rights on it. And I think it's kind of, it's the cultural attachment to it. Like there's only a thousand, you know, rookie cards of LeBron James um, on Top Shot. And so why would Top, you, you said Top Shot could go make more. But like, why, then the NBA and Top Shot would be basically shooting themselves in the foot. They have this massive marketplace mm. where they've made millions of dollars. So if they go in, if this shows very clearly, <clears throat> can, can you only buy of them on made. Top Shot? Can you or can huh? you buy like once you buy your things on Top Shot, can you sell them in other marketplaces or can you only buy and sell them at Top Shot? So right now, Top Shot's like in quote unquote beta, and um, so currently it's not. Although very interestingly, beta sign is not there. Um, but right now, it's it's a custodial thing right now. So the, it is sort of centralized. Top Shot's controlling it, but the Flow blockchain has like a whole um, kind of flow. They call it a Flowverse. They have like a, a 
a digital conference happening on Discord this week. Um, and basically they're gonna allow it so that it could open up and go to other marketplaces, be it OpenSea or whatever. It's just, I guess it's kind of custodial right now. I think um, OpenSea it has is a, working on uh, being able to cross list it. With you know, Flow, yeah. With so the, flow, so yeah. there's a so there's a bunch of stuff on Flow, like CNN <laughs> is releasing stuff on Flow. So I bought like, um, Wolf Blitzer uh, announcing Biden and Trump. There's two separate ones. Um, there's like an N-Way play. It's like Olympic pins. So you know how people go and collect pins at Olympics. Yeah, so yeah, it's a digital yeah. version. You buy a box and it's like really fun. Like, honestly, I encourage you to just go to Top Shot and buy like a $9 pack and open it with the kids. It's kind of fun. And it, that, that kind of pack opening experience has mm. a certain excitement because it's like, oh, you don't know what you're going to get. Are you going to get, you know, one of your favorite team or one of your favorite players? Um, so I think it's kind of that cultural tie-in that, and then like, I know that like I have um, the Superman first ever NFT on VV and there's only 8,888 of them like in the world. And I, I guess DC comics could make more, but this is the first one. Um, they can't make more of the first one. They can make a second and a third and I'm sure they will, but basically, yeah. So I got the Superman there. That's oh, kind of blurry. Hmm. Superman NFT. So for me, it's like, I can kind of bank on the fact, okay, if NFTs are going to be big in the future, I think it will. Um, and then I can, can I, is Superman, are there going to be more than 9,000 people in the world who are going to want to have a Superman NFT? And I think so, yes, because <laughs> there's a lot of Superman fans. So that's why, uh, to me, it's like being early in on some of these things. And with Top Shot, the neat thing is, is if you're kind of one of their, um, you know, uh, big, bigger collectors, they'll, or if you're in the, the, if you have a certain set called the Cool Cat set, you kind of might get like a bit earlier access from the public to some of their newer projects. Like they just announced NFL. Um, and so that's going to hopefully deliver some value as well. Like I joined, a, there's a Dr. Seuss, you can collect pins um, and things of that nature. So, so yeah, so it's just kind of exciting to kind of get involved with, and then in these discords you're connecting with people who like basketball you know like and a lot of people are making like new friends like these days you know everybody's at home and you kind of only really like controlling who you're hanging out with like it's been really uh, fun to kind of connect with people on twitter or just people that i had a, i was an acquaintance of but i became closer friends with through connecting over the kind of the collecting experience um so yeah like, what is your favorite uh, musician, uh, Sonny? Who's your favorite artist? Oh, God. Uh, I don't know. I mean, there's, I don't think I have a favorite musician. Who Let's, okay, so we were talking about Drake. Like, if, say, back in the yeah, day. Drake is good. So another uh, use case for NFTs is tickets. So uh, if you make a ticket, an actual NFT, then when scalpers and people on secondary markets are reselling it, then the original uh, ticketing event, whether it's Drake, he can get a, a cut of every time that ticket changes hands. So it can be more lucrative for the actual creator. Plus, if you have like a ticket from say Drake's first, you know, concert ever, let's say in Toronto, I don't know even know where, when that would be. But to say you had that original physical ticket and you kept it in like good condition, you got it authenticated and graded. I'm sure you could send that, sell that on eBay for like a good amount of money. So, but with NFTs, it takes away having to, you know, store it physically, but you'd have the NFT ticket as a keepsake for the future. So then in the future, when people are like, oh, you, you're like, yeah, I went to Drake's first ever uh, thing, you know, well, it's like, how, prove it. Well, I have the NFT ticket from that I event. I actually love that, Alan. Like one of the things that I kind of like was seeing, like, I'd love to talk to Ticketmaster and be able to NFT all the tickets that come out of it. Because you know what? I... I'm nostalgic sometimes. I like, you know, first concert I went to with, with my husband, I have a ticket somewhere in an album, right? And, you know, imagine there's there's probably several of me, so it doesn't have to be super expensive as an NFT, but like, I just want to hold it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think like, if you look at human, we're going back to human civilization, like, did we start at money? No, we didn't start at money. We started collecting things and then we started trading things that we collected. So collecting, uh, you know, whether it's different tools or rocks or whatever the earliest humans were doing, that's how the first economy was kind of built. So 
Um, I've kind of discovered this over the year and kind of through uh, my passion with the NFTs is just how much of a collector I am. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of potential um, tied in. And another thing with like Top Shot, for example, is it allows like given team to collect, to connect with who's their most hard hardcore fan. Like in uh, Toronto, we have the super fan, right? So uh, what uh, the Raptors could do is say, anybody who has a complete team set, which and Top Shot has the functionality to show you how further along you are on that. Whoever has that team set, when they come to a game, you get access to this special lounge. So it basically, you're kind of in the VIP suite because you're one of the biggest Top Shot collectors because you spent all this money on their secondary market and you bought all, all their best moments. Mm. Um, so it's a way for, it's a, another way for like these leagues or these organizations to get more information on who are their hardcore um, fans? Um, and like, what collectible can one enjoy in its all its glory on Mars? NFTs. So <laughs> it's going to be hard to take your collectibles from Earth to Mars. But if there's an internet in Mars, then NFTs can be enjoyed there as well. Interesting. Is there going to be Bitcoin on Mars? Dude, there's a reason SpaceX owns Bitcoin. And so there NFTs. you go. So what are the collectibles going to be? <laughs> they don't so have what NFTs. The... And Elon Musk has Bitcoin, <laughs> not NFTs. <laughs> Maybe not the best example, but I see what you're kind of saying. Not really. Okay, you're up. Anything? Wow. Any? Uh... <laughs> I don't know if I can talk that. I think Ahmed really understands, like you know what, like you know what this space is so early. Yeah. And you, like, I love being in this space, and I think it's it's. Um, it's just a, it's a Pandora's box. You can't stuff it back anymore and just be like, try to unsee it. You know what I mean? Like how people are going to use this and the applications and like, you know, the gated access. It's just like a cast. So just kind of like quick background. Like um, I've started this venture of the company that creates a plugin for brands mm -hmm. to actually, um, who are interested in doing NFTs to be able to sell NFTs through their Shopify platform okay. side by side their physical, you know, uh, physical like stuff right so we had a first client this company's called super plastic they make these vinyl toy collectibles and in fact they have these two dig digital characters called janky and googimon and they have such a great following that um forbes had them on their on their a front page um a whole bunch of different um like a actually no maybe not even Forbes I can't remember exactly but they had such a big following that Gucci and Fortnite asked them can these characters do a cameo on our stuff right and so the the president just turned around and just be like well you know what this is NFT worthy you know what I mean there's sniff tests of that right because there's digital characters that you know and so we did a drop for them last July but now they're embarking on this entire NFT universe such that you, if you own the specific NFT, then and only then can you buy the specific vinyl toy collectible. And, and I swear it's crazy because they, their artists are like amazing, like uh, with their design of it. And then on top of that, the physical thing as well, it's like, it's pretty cool. But then what we're seeing is that when it comes to like actually buying people now shifting and buying online, um, the NFTs, they or the physical product, they actually put more value in the the uh, NFT because it's gamified in some ways, right? It's similar to what Ahmed said. It's like unboxing or un unpacking the NFTs. And uh, but this is just a matter of time. Like um, we're already talking to a whole bunch of different brands that look at things like, for example, um, limited or uh, vintage wines, and with an NFT to just be like, if you have this NFT you could be part of this batch, you know, when, when we release it in the market a couple years from now or, or so. So, you know, what does that say about like um, goods and digital, you know, how that's basically a cross section and being able to deliver that. And, and the reason I got into this space as well is just because it, there shouldn't be, believe it or not, like buying Bitcoin, buying Ethereum is still pretty, like there's still a lot of friction. People are still scared because they don't know how to do this transfers, right? And, you know, the way that I'm approaching it is to say, hey, you know, if not a lot of people know how to go to OpenSea, connect their wallets, buy an NFT. But if I do it in such a way where I can create NFTs for brands and get John Smith to buy an NFT with his credit card, then that's just like, you know, another option to like, 
smooth out that idea of getting into the um, crypto platform. So, so Sunny, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question, Sunny. So this Bitcoin story is, you know, great YouTube. Uh, you know, I subscribed. I've been smashing that like button. So everybody smash that like button. But um, but I don't know how many subscribers you have. Dude, my um, mom started following me the other day, but then she unfollowed. So uh, it, it's hurting. It's hurting. It's rough. So, I do. I uh, forget. I'm not so anyways, so let's say, I, yeah. so I don't know how many subscribers Nothing. you have, but um. How do you know who your most like? Let's just say, let's just say three hundred thousand, just to just around. Okay, three hundred thousand. Okay, yeah. so do you know who your top hundred most ardent supporters are? Out of that three hundred three thousand, three hundred thousand. After this show, I do. Yeah, I know the top two. <laughs> so <laughs> basically, uh, I think I gave you the most likes, but yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> basically if you sold basically what i'm getting at is that if you sold an nft uh 100 nfts and of bitcoin stories and people bought that and then you created a discord chat with all those people and then now you know not only are they hitting the subscribe the subscribe button you're hitting the like button but they've actually put money behind it to be like hey i believe in what sunny's doing here i want to support his uh creative uh juices to spread the good word of bitcoin and I want to be connected to Sunny um, in a chat group where it's exclusive. There's only 100 of us. And then what you could do in turn is say, hey, I'm going to uh, you know, enlist your guys' feedback on the direction I'm heading with this podcast. So you know, offer suggestions whether you know, and, and get people to give their ideas. Or maybe people will go even further and you know, connect you with a given person to interview. I'm sure you know everybody to interview, but that's the kind of idea where you're kind of getting them behind you as well. And so if now you go from 300,000 to 2 million subscribers and these people are having some say in the direction of this podcast. I think that excites people. And then they might go and sell that NFT to somebody else who has deeper pockets, but also is really excited about what you're building here and wants to be involved. Um, so they'll buy it from them. And then now they'll be in the chat and be chatting with you and giving you suggestions. So it's a way for you to get like your um, subscribers or supporters or followers or whatever to kind of actually invest in you that, wow, this Sonny is, you know, he was early, like 2011, 2010, he was telling me about Bitcoin. Like if I believe in Bitcoin in the future, I want him to spread the good word, then sure, I might buy, a, you know, NFT of his for you know, whatever, 0.08 Ethereum uh, or whatever it might be. So do you know what the Howie test is? I know I'm sure Kay does, but doesn't that smell like the Howie test? Like doesn't pass it? Like I'm I'm betting on you with it's the hope not. that it'll go up. Here's here's my thing. It's my counter to that. So I love it. It sounds beautiful. The only reason I'm not successful is because I haven't launched an NFT. And that makes me feel good. <laughs> no. Because uh, that's a small <laughs> fix. Trust me. Oh, so <laughs> dramatic. Right, right. No, but dude, my show sucks because it's no good. Like, let's just face it. It's not, NFT is not going to change it. I do this show for me, okay? It's more for my own entertainment. That, that's my excuse. That's no, but what I wanted to say is, is that I'll tell you what does excite me as a, you know, up and coming podcaster <laughs> is, uh, is uh, so there's this new thing where you can set up a lightning channel and you can get Bitcoin Satoshis in real time. So as people are listening to me, they're streaming Bitcoin to me. I'm providing a service. They're paying me for it. They listen to five minutes of my show. I get 50 cents worth of Bitcoin. They listen to an hour. I get, you know, $5 or whatever that's Bitcoin solving that problem. That's them paying me for my service if they believe, and I'm setting something like that up. The thing about, I'm going to buy this token. There's only so many, it'll go up. It just starts to sound like a secure. And I used to sell like, you know, mutual funds. Remember, I don't know if you know, but WFG, all that stuff, like financial stuff way back in the day. So I kind of know a little bit about like the laws and stuff. And, and then when I hear about ICOs and even NFTs to some extent, oh, I'm going to buy it and it's going to go up in value. I start to worry about like, you know, is it and on what basis? And are we, you know, just hoping uh, or is there like some sort of fundamental value there? Anyway, so that, I, that was those are just some thoughts. But I, I okay, look, ultimately, I love the fact, Ahmed, that Ahmed, that there's no way you and I would be reconnecting after 10 years you know, just on Bitcoin, because obviously you weren't drinking the Kool-Aid there. So the fact <laughs> that we're even talking, that's a win, right? And and look, Kate uh, in the crypto space and she's helped build, you know, um, a Bitcoin fund that's accessible through your um, RRSPs, by the way. You can literally buy Bitcoin and hold it in your RRSPs because of 
case. So she's, you know, whereas you're, you know, new to the space, she's, she's in it. So I think, I definitely think there's something I'm, I'm missing. Unfortunately, I think I'm still missing it, <laughs> but only time will tell. Right. And here's my, my only takeaway with my only thing I'll leave you with is compare your, your financial gains as per the price of Bitcoin, not dollar gains, right? Like just compare it to Bitcoin in five years from now, two years from now, you know, I'd be, I'd love to see, you know, be like, yo, Sunny, I'm up, you know, 430% against the price of Bitcoin. If I would have invested in Bitcoin with the money that, you know, I, I had invested in NFTs, not that you even care about it because you don't care about making money. You're all about culture, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's culture, it's culture and, and, you know, community management. And that's what uh, Ahmed was like alluding mm. to about if you, you know, put Bitcoin stories in an NFT, it's more like then you, your engagement, you can go back to Discord and just be like, you can join this Discord if you have this specific NFTs and, and I will take into account all your you know, it, I would think that your your input will have more merit compared to all the other people that are trying to give me comments or something like that. No, but let, let's just say, let's just say somebody is like, they're watching one of my videos and they're like, yo, I want to give this guy $10. First of all, I think YouTube has some ability to send me $10, right? Like they have that functionality. Like now they, I think they do. So my point is, is like, if somebody really cares for me and he's just some random guy that's never heard about crypto or Bitcoin or whatever, he's probably just going to send me 10 bucks to YouTube. Or if I give him my Bitcoin address, but maybe he'll send me some Bitcoin. It. But it's not yeah. just about the money. Yeah. It's not just and about the money. It's about that you artifact. You have to realize that the people who are actually cryptos, like there's already a hook, right? If it's just like YouTube sending you money, then it's like, I, I find that, you know, people who are crypto, they're very, very sticky. Like I send you money. I want to know what's happening next. I follow through. I want I want you to send me that NFT and I want to see it in my wallet. You know, most people, they're like, oh, just send you 10 bucks. But then there's no real follow through. Are they actually, how engaged are they, right? What's your measure, right? And you can't trace it back. But on an NFT, it's pseudo anonymous the same way. So it's on blockchain. Then you come back and just be like, even drop them like, you know, like a, like a message saying, hey, you know, so-and-so people that um, listen to my podcast at like, you know, today at 4.02 p.m., for example, and they'll be like, um, you'll have access to my, like, another, like, pre-show or something like that, or inside, you know, insider comments or whatever, you know what I mean? That's the way I see it. Yeah, I think, like, I think you're kind of only looking at it from the money standpoint that, like, it's more of a, for you as a creator, it's that connection to see who actually sort of believes in you to get that NFT, to get into the chat with you and, and to give you your feedback. And that's just one way that you can utilize that information about who's kind of um, believes in your vision enough to hold the NFT. If somebody pays you right now for this YouTube video, I mean, what's gonna bring them back? You know, like you want them to subscribe. So it's like another type of subscribing, you know, you want somebody to subscribe because you're gonna keep giving them information. But NFTs is like another type of subscription, but to me, it's like the seeds are sown deeper because they've kind of spent some money and they're holding this NFT to show that, oh, I still, you know, I'm about this. I didn't just flip it or sell it. I didn't, it wasn't about money. I'm holding it because, you know, I believe in um, what Sunny's doing and I want to contribute. It's not about necessarily, oh, I think it's going to be worth a million dollars and there are a million Bitcoin in the future or whatever, or one Bitcoin in the future. Um, it's just, about maybe people with a like-minded vision doing something together and it's a way to sort of bring them together. There's a lot of different use cases and right now collectibles and buying it and selling it for hire is one, like it's kind of like websites, you know, in the nineties, if we said, oh, all websites are only, um, you know, commerce and, uh, and except yada, yada, yada. So, but things have evolved. I didn't know I would be able to order anything I wanted like in seconds to show up on my front door. There's things that we can't imagine that this technology, and it really comes back down to um, like blockchain, like Bitcoin is the first NFT, right? <laughs> it's the first um, blockchain tech. And um, so I think it's all part of the same kind of world um, and same continuum. Um, so that's why I think it's exciting. And, um, and like, yeah, like you need it is for me the reason why I hadn't dove into block Bitcoin and even like stepping outside of Top Shot took me months. Like I joined Top Shot in December and I opened, I like set up, we got some Ethereum ones in uh, July, 
right? And, but the reason is because like Topshop, like it doesn't even talk about blockchain. Like you don't even see anything about like flow or anything. It's just behind the hood um, and kind of learning about the collectible aspect. And there's a big barrier at times to like, okay, get your keys and your seed phrase and you have to write it down. Like, I don't know, that's a still a big barrier. Um, and only because I was like so deep into Top Shot that I, um, you know, decided, okay, like I'm seeing on Twitter, all these people are, you know, getting involved with stuff that's fun and exciting. I'm going to take the dive as well. Um, but that was a huge barrier. Like it took time and like get a ledger and, and write it down on a piece of paper and security and, and this and that. Um, and so that was why it was kind of a big, um, yeah, barrier for to get into Bitcoin all these years. But now that I'm kind of in it, I'm just thinking, okay, I just need to kind of pick the right time um, to strike um, and get, get in on the Bitcoin as well. But yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I, I think, I think I'm starting to get it. I, I, I mean, fundamentally, there's way more people that are interested in basketball than are interested in freedom. Yeah. Freedom is kind of like a, what does that even mean? Like, you know what I mean? Like the concept yeah, of yeah, being no, libertarian or sovereign or saving, all these things are kind of like, huh? Like, whereas like, dude, LeBron, baby, like Kawhi, yeah. Oof, Kawhi, exactly. Kawhi, bro. You know, so you can't beat Kawhi, right? He's like, he's got that, that, like you said, I guess like cultural appeal that uh, that and that like, is mainstream and it and it's and getting more people thing. to talk about Bitcoin crypto so all the power to them but uh, yeah <laughs> I guess uh, so, Sunny, the thing good is on that you <laughs> there's what? also something besides like you know building wealth right and the people you still need to spend somehow and I think that this side of the world of the NFTs is where you kind of like s- s- sort of spend and maybe sort of as an investment as way but as well like but i really see it as more like as an access token you know what i mean while my bitcoin is more like this is my store of wealth so i my my new fiat is bitcoin but then for all the other things that i do will be peppered with like other blockchains somehow you know if if it has merit right Mm. and there's some use case uh, there's some use case in terms of like film and animation i've i'm in on a couple uh interesting ones there's one glue factory course um and um it's like an animation and there's also stoner cats so the glue factory horse um I'm, i don't have enough time to like really get involved in everything but in the discord they have like writing uh essays and actually the people who own the nfts are actually cre- contributing to the creation of the animation so it's kind of a create a community driven way to do things and then the stoner cats one um, and it already has a creator group, but they are, they do like take feedback from, um, the creators and it's basically a way for, so actually Ashton Kutcher and Mila Kunitz are kind of, um, behind that. And also they have like Chris Rock and Seth MacFarlane and, uh, Jane Fonda are the voices for it. So they released like a five minute, um, first trailer that's been created. And so they sort of raise funds to make the rest of the episodes this way. And it's a way to kind of get away from, um, Hollywood uh, elites sort of controlling the message and controlling um, what's made and what's not made. So you're talking about freedom. Um, this is another way to um, get freedom of information and, and, and media as well kind of dominates things and decides what movies are in theaters or what gets funded. But this is a way for creators to go and sort of get um, some support and some funding to create what they want to create. And yeah, I don't know exactly what's going to happen with those animations, but I know it's like exciting to know that like um, that when episode two comes out, like I'm going to want to watch it and not everybody in the world has access. And sure, somebody will, you know, put it on YouTube. Um, But yeah, it's kind of fun to be part of something where it's like, hey, screw you, Hollywood elites. We're going to like go and make an animation ourselves. And and and, you know, I'm on board to support that kind of thing and kind of decentralize um you know creation yeah and you can only watch actually the episodes for stone and cats if you have the nft for Stone and cats yeah exactly yeah um so it's yeah it's kind of um i, I mean i'm hoping to see what happens in the future but i thought like wow these big names and their whole like stated mission of the whole thing is that like we've been wanting to make this animation for 10 years and nobody in hollywood's like greenlit it um, so we wanted to go to the community basically, um, and kind of create it with them. So it, there's other like 
you know, um, you know, you could go get it fundraising and get money to do something like that. But this kind of hits a little bit different because I still hold the actual token. Plus for them, as that token's being traded each day, um, they're kind of taking a cut. So they're getting more and more funding to basically go towards the creation of, of this. And, and they also give access to like um, unique drops in the future that they have. So they'll give like a 24 hour window for people that own that token to go and mint this other token. Um, and I'm not saying money, but I'm, it might have value as well. You might be in another community that resonates with you and connect with folks. So um, I think that culture and the community is a big part of it. Um, but I think there's a lot of use cases in the future, like um, like homes are non-fungible, right? Each home is unique. And so there's an idea um, to basically, I think Gary V was talking about this, where you basically, instead of having like a deed on your house, you put the smart contract on an NFT and it's kind of locked in that way. So you sell it, um, but you can maybe put it on that deed that each time that house gets resold, you take 1%. If it's a super unique home, um, that's how your contract, you can make it. Maybe you think that's dumb. I don't necessarily think I'd buy a house where somebody's getting a 1% cut every time it flips, but maybe if it's like super unique um, type of home, then, so there's a lot of use cases. And I think it's only just an extension of what Bitcoin is. And it's, um, it's an evolution and they both can coexist. And I would love to have some Bitcoin, you know? So I'm taking Bitcoin if anybody's offering. I'm on board with Bitcoin. <laughs> but, um, but I think NFTs is a way to bring the mainstream in. And I think uh, Dapper Labs is a Vancouver company. I love when it's a Canadian company. Um, and they're building some big things. Like in bringing like the NFL in, that's going to bring a huge American audience. Were like, you telling me that Dapper Labs are the, is a team behind CryptoKitties? Yeah, they made CryptoKitties and they basically with CryptoKitties, I think it was like 2018, 2017, they um, quote unquote, like crashed the Ethereum network at that time. And the gas fees essentially killed, killed it. It still exists today. Um, I think um, the like Genesis CryptoKitties are expensive, but it's a game into itself. So I think you need to understand it because you can breed. So what, after that experience, that's when they went and made um, the Flow blockchain. So I think his name what, is Peter he's Shirley. He's the genius behind the blockchain. But then Roham and Sam uh, Gari Kazalu are the kind of founders. Roham is the CEO. Um, and Wait, they I have, have a question. So what happened to CryptoKitties? Because we're talking about NFTs as if they're brand new. I told you the other day that Bitcoin's been on the rare Pepe's and all that way back in the day with Counterparty. But uh, but what happened to CryptoKitties? Meaning, like you just said, just the just the kind of the the what's it called the Genesis ones have value. So to me, that signifies that ninety nine percent of the people that put their money into the other CryptoKitties lost it. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not like anybody who gets any NFT ever the value is going to increase. Like, there's going to be a no, ton no, of because ninety nine percent of people that uh, got into Bitcoin has always made money because it's it's a kind of an, it's always hitting all time highs. My point is like, so is it true that ninety nine percent of the people that got into Crypto Kitties are are essentially losing money? I mean, I don't know for sure, but I think there's a large portion of NFTs in general that are going to not, uh, you know, return higher value than the, what they were. But it's just like. You know, how many websites failed? How many companies fail? Like, sure. that's not a that's not a reason to kind of discount an entire industry that's kind of forming out of the ground. And CryptoKitties, um, I think the fact is, is that the, with the gas prices, the way that it's designed, it's just like too expensive to do. And that's why they created this flow blockchain. There's all kinds of different games. I can't even keep up. Like, it, I, it, there's a lot. There's another one actually called Record Shop or RCRD. Mm -hmm. And they're actually releasing music as nfts so i have like a you know it's electronic dance music right now um but i have like a whole edm set that's on an nft type thing and that's really powerful for artists because you know spotify i don't think pays very well um but if they can release music this way um you know there, there's some power there so you're right i think crypto kitties definitely fizzled um but that was just the beginning of it and i think they might be moving CryptoKitties, I hear, to flow and then transaction fees. It's basically they take 5% on uh, Top Shot, um, but you don't have to deal with gas. Like all that, like Ethereum gas wars, like is a huge headache. That's why I'm generally like more into the flow, but then I kind of saw what was happening with Ethereum and I, you know, wanted to get in on the mix and it's been good over there as well. 
Cool, cool. Okay, sorry, were you gonna share something here? Or uh... there's actually other chains that are like that we're exploring now that use Ethereum as the, the base layer. So okay. there's a company called palm.io. In fact, the people behind it have like you know some kind of like connections with Harry Potter, for example. So think about that. Harry Potter on the freaking NFT. You know, it's just a matter of time, right? Uh -huh. There's also Immutable X in their base in Australia. They also they use kind of like these rollups, kind of like um, I think ZK rollups to kind of like proof of work, kind of like uh, validation. Also cheaper, um, lower. It's I think in the pennies or a couple of dollars, like um, in order to for gas fees for that. Um, but they they have the developers and the artists behind. God's Unchained, if anyone knows who that is. I've heard of them. Yeah, so they're, this this Immutable X, their thing is like, foray, they're really foraying into like um, the collectible slash like um, gaming kind of like Axie. Yeah, I think uh, Vivi um, is moving over to Immutable X like soon. And I think TikTok is working with uh, Immutable X. Yes, like they're so competent, like uh, Immutable X, like their CTO and all that. They We've talked to them and they're just like, they they know how to handle like blockchain properly. And like, yeah, like I, I can't figure out like what blockchain is the best one, but oh, I wanted to ask you if that's okay, Sunny, a question like with Bitcoin. Um, so I, ha I have invested in like obviously Ethereum and there's another one, Hex, but I know that Bitcoin, it's neither deflationary or inflationary. It's just fixed. Bitcoin is deflationary. Bitcoin is deflationary? Yeah. Ethereum oh. is disinflationary, which is like in between deflationary and inflationary. So why is, uh, I'm just like honestly asking, I don't know the answer, but why is it better to be deflationary versus inflationary? Like, isn't there some value? I know out of control inflation is bad, but is there some value from a like economic standpoint to have um, deflationary versus inflationary? That's a good question. Um, I mean, what is inflation? Inflation is essentially like when you think about it in our money sense, it's like us, our dollar losing value over time. And the mm -hmm. reason it's losing value is because a certain group of people can print as many dollars as they want. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the more they print, the more inflation that happens, right? And so, um, so yeah, so Bitcoin, if you look at the Genesis, uh, there was an article that Satoshi, you know, kind of referenced in the Genesis block, which is this reference to money printing, you know, back in 2007, eight, when the whole financial crisis happened, you know, when the banks lost all their money, they turned to the public and they asked governments to print money or whatever it is, or to tax people and pay them back for the risks that they took. So the banks took the risks and then they turned to the people to help them, you know, when they, when shit hit the fan, right? So that's, mm. that's, um, so, so Bitcoiners are very much against this, you know, this, like, it, we consider it almost like theft, right? It's like the, the disappearance of value of your money because of some arbitrary people. So I mean, in general, um, you know, supply and demand, right? So if you just increase the supply of money, the demand of it's going to go down, right? And the price is going to go down. So in general, like the everybody in the world, you know, the, the, the way the financial system works today, it, it's based on something called Keynesian economics. And it pretty much prescribes this idea that, yes, you need to keep printing money to, you know, so that people can spend more and blah, blah, blah. But Bitcoiners believe, don't believe in that entire paradigm. We believe in something called Austrian economics, which is kind of like before even, you know, fiat came about and it was something where it's more relevant. It's more reminiscent of like the gold standard. So, so that's why a lot of people refer to Bitcoin as kind of like digital gold um, or mm. gold 2.0. Um, and so, yeah, so, so deflationary, all that means is it starts at zero in 2000, whatever, uh, whenever it started 10 years ago. And then it, it, it actually approaches, it's like an asymptote. It, it approaches a line of 21 million. So in, I think 2140, we're going to have about 21 million Bitcoins in total in the world. And, and to me, that's, that's very exciting because there's never going to be more than 21 million. And, you know, one half of every transaction on earth, whether it's for house, whether it's for top shots or cricket or for a event or for flowers, one half of every transaction is money. And so the fact that that very thing is kind of corrupted to its core, which is what Bitcoiners believe. And, you know, the last 10 years, a billion and a half percent increase in price, blah, 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 I think shows that the experiment's working and that, 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 that the modern financial gurus have it, you know, 
uh, amazingly wrong. Um, but but this is the beauty of it, right? It's not that there's no uh, you know no one's holding a gun to your head. Nobody's saying you have to buy Top Shots or Bitcoin or Ethereum. It's it's more just people coming together, having conversations, and choosing to. Um, but yeah, I think Bitcoin is, okay, sorry, is yeah. awesome. Yeah. But yeah, so I think that's close to an hour and a half, dude. I, you know, my goal again, I, I know it came on a little bit strong, but my goal was just to article, <laughs> you know, what two people's perspectives are on NFTs. I'm obviously on the other side of it, but uh, I like, you know, I like hearing people out, keeping somewhat of an open mind and, uh, you know. And, and I I'm think sure, there's no sides. There's no sides. We're all on the same side. We're on the, we're on the same world. side. Yeah, the it's just like, there, it's, well, a spectrum. There it's a is, spectrum. But there are people. Bitcoin maxis, where if you kind of even float there, you're dabbling into the NFTs, it's almost like in their eyes, you might lose some clout, which I think is, you know, overkill, but there are some people like that. So I don't know, if, uh, Sunny, I want to pose that question to you. Does that, is that kind of like one of the things where that like worries you a little bit where, you know, people know you're like a Bitcoin or OG? No, and then no. I, I don't think I don't. I mean, I try not to think too much about what people will think of me. I try and use first principles thinking. If you answer, uh, look at everything I'm asking, it's like not because of someone thinks something. It's just like straight up, like ones and zeros. Like, how does this thing work? Like, how how is it, you know, different from, you know, a JPEG? I, I just, like I said, Bitcoin, I read the white paper 10 years ago. I was like, ah, like, sign me up, baby. Like, this is it, right? Like, totally so. But since then, or up until then, and since then, I have not ever had like that kind of, you know, crazy like aha moment. And I just haven't. And anyways, but, you know, like I said, I, I think it's great that, you know, more people are getting into crypto and Bitcoin and all that. And look, at the end of the day, UnoCoin, my company is a marketplace, right? So we sell Ethereum and, you know, we'll bring on more crypto assets. And, flow, you can have flow. Yeah, flow, baby. We'll do it all, right? But. Me. Yeah, but I, me personally, I'm kind of like, I've drank the, the Bitcoin Kool-Aid. I just love it. I just love it. I love Bitcoin. Well, why, do you, a, why do you just it. only love it? You know, it's like, for me, it's like, hey, love Bitcoin, you know, yeah. Bitcoin Maxi, you know, rub Best each other's shoulders. But there's other things in yeah. the world. Like, in your house, don't you have anything that, like... I love it. I love knowledge? my wife. I love my kids. I mean, I love them. I mean, if we're talking So you don't have love, any books or... Uh, I have you know, books that I love, absolutely, but nothing, like nothing like i mean bitcoin dude it's like like i've dedicated 10 years of my life i make shows about it that people don't even watch like how the hell do i have a show with 120 episodes <laughs> where i'm averaging like i don't even know how many views like barely any so I, it's just because i'm obsessed with it you know I'm, I'm completely like mad about bitcoin i, I love it I, I think it why because i realized a long time ago that the powers to be essentially have humanity in a in a you know a stranglehold and they've essentially done it through money. Like, it's so hilarious when you step back and look at the fact, when you look at a $20 bill and it's just like this piece of paper and it's got a picture of some lady or some dude and here you are, you're a pharmacy, two pharmacists, I'm an engineer, I'm a finance person. It's like, we're all just slaving away just to run after this piece of paper. I mean, that's the real joke if you ask me, right? Like, I mean, yeah, we could talk about NFT. This is more of a sophisticated conversation, but the fact that everybody believes that dollars is like the be all and end all to me is, is hilarious. And so when I saw Bitcoin, I was like, it's limited. Nobody can change it. There's no guns that are enforcing it. It's nonviolent like Gandhi talked about, right? It's, 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 it's the epitome of peace, dude. It's so beautiful. And now, like I said, El Salvador, what their Bitcoin is their cryptocurrency, like the richest man on earth, uh, Elon Musk, right? Three months ago. Oh my God, I'm late to the party. I finally get it. Like, okay, I'm going to buy some Bitcoin, right? Um, so I don't know. Jack, you want to talk about Twitter? Let's talk about Twitter. I met Jack Dorsey, dude. Jack is not an NFT enthusiast. He's a Bitcoiner. He's literally like, you can follow his thread. He's always like shitting on people that even talk about Ethereum. He's like, nah, not, nah, that's not even relevant. So if he was really big on, I mean, I know he sold an NFT for some hundred grand or whatever, but seriously, dude, he's one of the biggest Bitcoiners the planet's ever seen. I mean, he, he, go to his Twitter handle. It only has one word in it. Bitcoin. Why is Jack Dorsey, why is Tesla, why is SpaceX, why all the biggest financial entities in the world, all the biggest hedge, why are they all talking about Bitcoin? It's because of what many of us saw 10 years ago. And unfortunately, many of us still aren't seeing, but I'll keep trying. I'll keep doing my job. <laughs> are you talking about me? Or just oh, of course course not. <laughs> <laughs> wow. No, because it's evident that you don't really believe in it because you, you also kind of indirectly admitted that you don't own any. 
I so this I argument is actually no, argument. He's it's about me he's fighting for late. your future grandkids. No, I that's want what the argument just... is about. It's about me fighting for your future grandkids because that's Bro. what Bitcoin. You're not. You don't buy Bitcoin for your first name. You buy it for your last name. Sorry, that was a retweet. Uh, so someone else's shit. Timing like, sorry, beats speed. I don't even know what that means. means. That sounds like I'm, like a I'm trying to time it right. That's why you know with the Bitcoin, it's about timing. Right. When you get your paycheck every month, well, you're a boss, you're your own boss. But whenever you get that, you know, that lump sum of money every month, dude, whatever you don't spend, put it into Bitcoin. And then of that, put 1% of it in other things, right? And then 1% of that, put it in NFTs, like 50 bucks or something or whatever. But like, other than that, more than that, dude, you're gambling I'm, and I your grandkids and I will have a talk. Sorry, go ahead, Kate. I would I would rather be paid in Bitcoin, to be honest. Yeah, I'd rather be paid in Bitcoin. I'd take my Bitcoin pocket. anytime over a dollar. Anybody out there, they, I, I, by the way, I have over a hundred songs that I've written. They all suck. You think my videos are bad? Check out my songs on SoundCloud, all available, sunnyray.com. Nobody watches it. You think if I make an NFT out of that shit, anyone's going to listen? Nobody, dude. It's going to be even harder. <laughs> but I don't I think didn't it say it was going to make a success, but no, you're, <laughs> you're serving the Kool Aid. You're serving the Kool Aid. I'm taking sips. Okay. I'm gonna, okay. Uh, we're going to talk again soon and um, we are going to be full I, on chugging. I, I, I'm kind of happy that the night. convinced him this week to get into Bitcoin. <laughs> do it. Do it. No, no. I, I hey, look, I, I, it's all, uh, it's a nice little debate. Ahmad, uh, dude, this has been good. I can't believe 90 minutes flew by. And Kay, you came. Woohoo. And Kay, you still owe me another episode <laughs> where we go into, you know, the other stuff and everything as sure. well. But okay. I've also been in hiatus for almost, you know, two months because I've been busy with work. So thanks for bringing me out of my slumber. And uh, I'm back later, guys. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you. This is super fun.